I'm Audrey Main. I'm a youth services department at the Hyattsville branch. I'm Beth Lewis. I'm a librarian at Hyattsville. Hi, um, my name is Hannah. I'm a librarian at the Hyattsville branch. I'm Monica McAvee. I am a selection librarian for adult fiction. <laughs> this is Audrey Maynard. I am going to share with you some great fantasy reads that are categorized primarily for teens, although tweens could read them, adults could read them. I hope you like what we have to tell you today. First up, I'm going to tell you about a book called Dread Nation by Justina Ireland. It came out in 2018, and it's really uh, a horrific kind of zombie apocalypse kind of story. America is suddenly and horrifically changed during the Civil War period when the dead suddenly rise from the grave. Mm. Jane McKean attends a special combat academy to become a Negro attendant, serving a well-off patron and learning to combat zombies. But a terrifically horrible conspiracy is revealed and everything has changed. With a bunch of allies, she hopes to make her way to Summerland, where maybe there'll be some peace. Um, it's followed up by Deathless Divide, which came out earlier this year. This is, um, has strong female characters, obviously a zombie apocalypse, uh, oppression, and white supremacy. The author was inspired by American Indian boarding school system. Uh, to help to create this tale. Next up, I'd like to tell you about The Dark Days Club by Helen Goodman, which came out in 2016. It's part one of a trilogy. It's historical fantasy, Regency romance, and a little bit of steampunk in it. Turning 18 and expected to make a titled match, orphaned Lady Helen develops extraordinary hearing and super reflexes. She's recruited to the Dark Days Club to train under Lord Carlston and others and to join its secret battle against supernatural enemies. The pace is measured and quickens by the close. The period is well researched and the characters are well developed. The romance thread continues in the following book, The Dark Days Pact, which came out in 2017. Again, it's part of a trilogy. The next in this category of sort of historical fantasy, um, but this one's the, the most tied to history, Mark of the Thief, and this is the only tween title I'm recommending, sort of grades five to nine by Jennifer Nielsen. First of a trilogy came out in 2015. Nicholas Cava offers an insider story of an enslaved person in ancient Roman empire. He gains the power of a magical bulla or amulet and the companionship of a fabulous griffin. He makes other allies in the struggle for survival. This is fast paced with nearly relentless action and might appeal to readers of the Percy Jackson series. It's followed by Rise of the Wolf in 2016. The next category I've got for you is mythology. The first is the Star Touched Queen, came out in 2016 by Roshani Choksi. Maya agrees to sacrifice herself in the complicated maneuverings that is happening in her father's kingdom. Suddenly, she's snatched away and offered to become queen of a mysterious alternate universe, parallel universe kingdom. There are realms in here where life and death become blurred. There's some welcome humor fairly late in the story in the sidekick course called Kamala. There's romance and predestination. The writing style is lushly descriptive and detailed world building. I almost really think it would appeal more to adults than teens. Mm -hmm. There's strong female characters and intensifying pace. The importance of family and sacrifice is also highlighted. It's got lots of Asian influenced fantasy elements and mythology. This would be in the high fantasy category and it own voices. Also in mythology, Sky in the Deep by Adrian Young that came out in 2018. Two warring clans have appointed skirmishes over a long period of time. Captured in battle, Elin discovers her dead brother actually survived and joined the enemy's side. She struggles as a slave of the Riki, 
and slowly adjusts to their village and forms allies. Finally, she joins in as the clans must unite against their common implacable foe. The stakes are high, survival is uncertain, and the warring is nearly relentless. It's visceral. War is hell. Might, uh, she mixes in some Viking and Norse mythology is strong female character, but she's not anachronistic. That is, she seems like a person of her time, a realistic female of her time. Next category is mythopoic, or mixing um, known mythologies with mythologies that the author has made up in her, his or her own world. Probably my favorite of all of these, and I'm sort of notorious for recommending this book, The Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lainey Taylor, came out in 2011, part of a trilogy. This series features chimera, chimera, angels, other species of creatures, parallel worlds, pretty epic world building. The story finds Karu stuck when the portals between worlds abruptly close. Eventually, she'll get some answers about herself and why she feels that there's things that she knows but she can't quite surface about herself. But that's only the beginning of this trilogy. It's fast-paced, romantic, and suspenseful with lyrical, descriptive writing. It's followed by Days of Blood and Starlight, which I actually kind of skimmed rather than reading fully because it's constant warring back and forth and I couldn't take it but it finishes up beautifully in Dreams of Gods and Monsters. And the last of the books that I've read, also in Mythopoic, is Scorpio Races by Maggie Stiefvater, also came out in 2011. I listened to this in audio and I thought this was a great way to experience this story. It's Mythopoic, a little bit dystopian, and has some world building in there. Sean Kendrick and Puck Connolly alternate telling us about their try to win the Scorpio races, an event that uses deadly water horses, a variation in Celtic mythology, who sometimes can be a little bit tamed. Winning could bring financial security and losing might mean death. If you love horse stories, even those involving killer horses, this might be for you. This is a fast paced story, descriptive, and romantic. Finally, I'd like to finish with a book that I'm looking forward to reading. I'm looking forward to reading This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amar El Motar and Max Gladstone. It came out last year. Female spies, red and blue, regularly sabotage each other's work. Then they begin leaving notes for, you, for each other, and then they begin falling in love. Reviews predict that readers will want to reread this one to really engage with this complex story. Uh, they say the writing is complex, engaging and lyrical, involves time travel, enemies to lovers, trope and romance. It's epistolary, that is, mostly takes place in letters. Science fiction, we've cataloged it under the adult category and LGBTQIA love. And that's it for me. I love urban fantasy, stories where it's our familiar world, uh, but almost maybe something different happened in the past, causing so many changes in what we're used to, or it's our world with a twist. Maybe the twist is that there's magic, or whether we know about it or not, or maybe there are shapeshifters, or vampires, or elves. Charles Lint wrote some of the first in this uh, category. The other world tends to work just out of sight of just out of sight in the Lynch works, waiting for some chink to appear. In Memory and Dream, uh, one of the books that we have as an ebook, fantastic creatures gain access to the bohemian village of Newford through the work of a talented young painter. They read fantasy, art, and struggle together in a, in a beautiful, atmospheric tale. He's a, a very lyrical writer. Stormfront is the first book in the Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. And that's a great example of urban fantasy. Harry Dresden is the only wizard who's listed in the Chicago Yellow Pages. She works for the detective of the Special Investigations Unit of the Chicago Police Department to solve some murders that seem to have been done magically. 
needless to say, complications ensue. Harry is a complex character who intrigues and entertains us for a whole series of books. A few years ago, there was even a TV adaptation for one season, which did a really good job of capturing the feel of the books. If you enjoy them, there are lots of stories featuring Harry, 34 and still counting. Speaking of TV shows, most people know True Blood, Waitress Suki and Vampire Bill's Adventures in a Small Arkansas Town. If you enjoyed that, you should definitely check out Charlene Harris's series, beginning with Dead in the Dark. Different and more in nuanced than the show, the books create a very believable town and a number of memorable characters. Suki is lovable and quirky, and her interactions are always fun to share. It doesn't have to be our contemporary world to make a compelling story. Naomi Nowick's Temeraire series takes the Napoleonic War era and adds an aerial component, dragons and their riders. The first book, His Majesty's Dragon, introduces Captain Will Lawrence to the dragon Temeraire, from his hatching to their growth as an able and competent fighting team. Harry Turtledove is another author who takes the alternate, alternate history concept and runs with it. Guns of the South is probably his best known, in which a group of white supremacists travel back in time to supply Robert E. Lee with AK-47s, resulting in a Confederate victory for the Civil War. Their idea of how things should go is not the same as Lee's, however. Turtle Dove has a number of other alternate history titles, mostly World War II, sometimes with aliens, that are definitely worth checking out. E.K. Johnson, that inevitable Victorian thing, doesn't depend on magic to change things around. But it's a change in history, specifically Queen Victoria, whose strength and thoughtfulness make the British Empire a major force in today's world. One of her descendants stars in a surprising, romantic, and thought-provoking story with an interesting LGB, et cetera, twist. Another by that author is the story of Owen. Owen is a normal teenager. He loves hanging out with his friends, helps with with algebra and football, but he's valued in protecting his town from the ever-present danger of dragon. In a lighter vein, Spider Robinson's Callahan Chronicles collects the first three books about Callahan's bar. You never know who or what will show up in Mike Callahan's place, but they always have good stories and puns. Lots and lots. Mike does have a firm policy, however, of time travelers to you catch. Alona Andrews has several series that I recommend highly. Clean Sweet is the first of the Innkeeper Chronicles. It may seem like any other quaint Victorian D&D in a small Texas town, but the visitors might be from anywhere in the galaxy or relaxed by shifting to their work here. The innkeeper is there to make their guests comfortable and to keep their differences hidden from the rest of them. Did I mention that the innkeeper, and it's a family business, is magic, and so is her end. In Andrew's Kate Daniels series, which begins with magic bites, our world has suffered a mag mag magic apocalypse. She pushed the technological pro process too far, and now magic has turned into vengeance. It comes in waves, without warning, and vanishes as soon as it appears. When magic's up, flames drop out of the sky. Cars stall, electricity dies. When magic is down, guns work and spells fail. Kate is a mercenary in Atlanta. She likes her sword, maybe a little too much, has a hard time controlling her mouth, and it's always fun to read about. Mira Grant's another author with more than one interesting series. For example, Newsflash, the first book of which is Feed. You have cured cancer. We had just a common cold, but in doing so, we created something new, something terrible that no one could stop. The infection spread, virus walks, taking over bodies and minds with one unstoppable command, feed. It's a different kind of zombie story. We were tested for infection every time we enter a building, limit ourselves to safe areas. Does it sound uncomfortable to me? For parasitology series begins with parasites. A decade in the future, humanity thrives in the absence of sickness and disease. We owe our good health to a humble parasite, a genetically engineered token. But what happens when the womb becomes separated? What happens when a young woman is in a car accident and is brain dead, but there's another brain there that's taken over? 
perpetuating ethnicity stories. T.J. Kuhn has an intriguing book called The House of the Cerulean Sea. Linus Baker is a by-the-book postworker in the Department of, in charge of magical use. He's tasked with determining whether six magical children in one of the orphanages here in the sea are dangerous. Since one of them is Lucy, which is short for Lucifer, yes, dangerous could be a, an appropriate um, adjective, but he's also a little boy. He loves music and needs a family. Uh, Moon Called is the first book in the Mercy Thompson series by, by Patricia Briggs. Mercy grew up in a werewolf pack, but while she is a shapeshifter, she isn't one of them, she runs an auto repair shop in Washington State and finds herself drawn back into the wolf's world to help a kid who comes to her for help. Mercy is a very interesting and relatable character and the relationship and politics are fascinating, along with the various adventures she can't help but get involved in. The series has 12 books and is still going strong and well worth it is. Set in Mercy's world, but with rules of its own, Fry Wolf is the first in Patricia Briggs' Alpha and Omega series. Anna didn't know anything about werewolves until she became one and came a pack. She survives at the bottom of her pack, but it turns out she's a rare Omega and that dangerous her. Magic use has a cost. A hound works to trace users who illegally offload their cross under someone else. In Devin Monk's Sally Dexton series, starting with Magic to the Bone, Allie Moonlight is a hound rather than upset the family's fortune and the strength that they live in. But when somebody is forging magic signatures and hers is found on her dead father, complications can serve. And Allie has to cope with an increasing number of them in an absorbing world over nine intriguing books. What I'm looking forward to reading next, I'm two novellas behind on the wonderful Lois McMaster Dubois, Kenrick and Desdemona story, The Orphans of Last Day, and The Physicians of the Night. So the first book that I chose is a part of a series, or actually rather it is the whole series. It's one of my favorite reads of 2019, and that is The Motorbot Diaries. I am obsessed with these. Um, so what it's about, it's about Murderbot, who is called a sec unit, which is short for security unit. Um, and it's, he's an android human construct, and it's his job, pretty much whether he likes it or not, at first how it starts, to protect humans. And he's got all these really cool, like, um, augmentations. He can, like, um, has really great processing abilities with, like, to be able to communicate with computers. Um, and it's interesting because he learns how to disable his governor's model. So he has like free will, he can go and do what he wants. Um, and it's like his adventures throughout um, this futuristic space world. It's also interesting because he kind of just is completely done and fed up with humans. But his um, time out in space, it keeps going back to humans and protecting humans. And it's like a really fascinating study of what really is, it, it, what it means to be human. Because even though he's like an android, it's fascinating to watch and to read rather about how his thought process goes and it's in first person and he's just very human in just about everything that he does. Well, at the same time, it's just sick and tired of humans. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a very fun, um, strangely lighthearted in some places, but then it can get very ex existential story about this android construct and his or its relationship with the humans that he's trying to protect. Um, it's got a lot of really good witty humor. Um, one of the things that I like about it too is that like he's very clearly asexual and it just does not want anything to do with any kind of romantic relationships and that's kind of funny to watch. Um, second one that I have is called The One by John Mars. And it's really interesting. So this one is about a world where like a simple DNA test is used to find the perfect mate. Um, what could possibly go wrong with that? A whole lot, apparently. It follows five individuals during their experience using this new technology to find the one. Um, and of course, things aren't all hearts and sunshine and rainbows. Every single individual, all the sub story subplots, there are all these twists and turns and gripping drama between each of the matches, this stuff that you can't even think of. And it's not even 
it just it doesn't go over the top with it either. Like I found like sometimes um, stories like that that are a lot of drama, they can be kind of far-fetched and a little bit reachy, but this one, it's actually very, very um, well written. Um, very, like extremely entertaining. I finished it like, within a day and just couldn't put it down. It was very into it. Um, and I think it would make a really good TV series or drama eventually if it isn't already. I, like one of those where I could see it probably being, um, there being like a TV show or something based off of it. But yes, that one's a really, really, really interesting read. Next on my list, I have We Are Legion by Dennis E. Taylor. It's the first book in the Bobaverse series. Um, it's the only one that I've read so far. And they all, when looking at reviews, they all sound really, really interesting. Um, it's kind of like a sci-fi space opera feel to it. Um, and it follows the story of Bob, who is this guy who sells his software company. And he's like really excited to start a new life with this money. And he wants to go on vacation. He has all these plans and everything that he wants to do. And he just decides to participate in this program that like they acquire his brain um, after he dies. And he just signs up for it, thinks it's something cool and interesting. Um, and unfortunately, like on his third day out in his new life, he gets hit by a car and he dies. And then he comes to as a consciousness that's been uploaded to a computer. And he realizes it's hundreds of years into the future. The story is, follows him as this artificial intelligence, as the ship out within space and it's fascinating too because there are a lot of other countries who are racing to do the same thing so he encounters other um consciousness that are like trapped within these ships and there's a lot of space battles but also a lot of really interesting um questions about like what is who we are and where do we begin where do we end because at certain points for example he makes copies of himself so the next couple ones that I have are definitely more of fantasy. Um, and I think a lot of these are young adults too. Um, first off, I have Spinning Silver, which was one of my favorite reads of 2019. Um, it's by Naomi Novik. It's a retelling of the Rumpelstiltskin story um, with a lot of really, really great bits of European, Eastern European folklore. Um, and it's one of those amazing stories with a great strong female lead, a couple of really good strong female lead characters. And it's beautifully written. There's like bits of magic just intricately woven throughout the whole story in such a way that it, um, at some points it doesn't even really feel so much as fantasy as it is of just this story of like magical, what is it? It takes place in like the 18th century Eastern Europe that's very fascinating. So yeah, give that one a check. The next one that I have is The Bear and the Nightingale, which is part of the Winterlight Trilogy by Kathleen Arden. Um, it's the story of Vasilisa who, she has the ability to see and communicate with household spirits. Um, this one also takes place in Eastern Europe, but I think more, um, it takes place in like Russia. Um, and the plot of it is you have Vasilisa who can see these spirits, these household spirits, and is taking place in a time where things are changing. Um, Christianity is starting to come in and flow in. So it's, um, and then also to her, she gets a new stepmother who is rather cruel, cruel and she does not like Vasilisa talking to these um, household spirits. So it kind of follows the story of this girl who has that ability in this new world, this new Russia, where they can't, um, she can't use it anymore and the household spirits are getting kind of anxious. And it's like the clash of the old world and the new world. Because um, it's one of the first um, young adult fantasy novels that I've read that has a lot of very heavy Russian folklore influences in it. Um, and finally, the book that I'm most excited about is City of Brass, um, part of the Devabad series. So the Devabad trilogy is so fascinating to me as well because it's probably the first fantasy book that I've read that has very heavy Middle Eastern um, Islamic influences. Um, and the next book is supposed to come out later this month. And it's 
beautiful. It um, focuses around uh, this hidden world of jinn that are similar to like what we think of as genies. Um, and they all have, they have different abilities and it follows this girl who um, was from Cairo and it turns out that she is also part Jen, And it follows along with her journey into this new world that's hidden amongst people. Um, and it's again, a very amazing read. It has, so many vivid characters, and I love how it really does work well with the um, Middle Eastern influences and the Islamic influences, because a lot of the fantasies that I read are um, European-based. Um, and I think, too, even within some of the magic, that's the capabilities that some of the jinn have speak to that as well. Okay, I wanted to share some dark fantasy or folklore, urban fantasy books with you today. First, The Prisoner of Midnight by Barbara Hambly. It's the latest installment in her vampire series or James Asher series. It's set in 1917 and um, it's vampires in World War I because obviously that needed to be more complicated. Um, it's great if you like historical fiction. Um, Barbara Hambly really does her research. She puts a lot of details in there. There's dark humor. There's a mystery in each book. There's appealing characters. She's got really fun descriptive language. It's a good read, and you can pick it up without having read others in the series. If you ask me, it kind of stands on its own. You'll get the gist of it by reading by reading the latest book. Um, Silver in the Woods by Emily Tesh is the next one I wanted to highlight. It's straight up folklore, fantasy, myth, little sprinkle of horror in there. There's also a romance. It has to do with uh, uh, Toby, who's the wild man who lived in the woods of Green Hollow. He you know, hangs out with dryads and his cat, and he's been there for hundreds of years, and he doesn't really think much about the outside world. Um, Green Hollow Hall, it's a new owner named Henry Silver, and everything changes. There's a romance between Tobias and Henry, and old things get dug up. And I won't say any more, except that it's a short book, so if you don't have a lot of time, it you know might not be too difficult to fit that into your day. Going back in time a little bit, um, The Prisoner of the Night and, and Silver in the Woods are both more recent publications, but the Dark Tower series by Stephen King is a classic. There are seven books, and you do need to start at the beginning for this, and they're not really standalone. It's one story in seven books. It's very different from the movie, so if you've seen the movie and you were intrigued, by all means pick up the books, but you should know that the world building and the plot and just everything is more Baroque and it's a different experience than um than watching the movie. There's more in there than they get into the film. Um, it's a pretty bleak uh, story, but there's humor in there. The characters are appealing. Um, it's about Roland, the world's last gunslinger, and the man in black that he's tracking. And I won't say anything more because you really just have to read the books. Moving on, um, Ben Aronovich. Um, wrote a series called the Rivers of London series. The first one is called Midnight Riot. It's called Midnight Riot in the United States. That's a different title in the UK, which I can't recall, but Midnight Riot is the one you'd want to look for if you want to pick it up. It's urban fantasy it's set in London. There's a really strong sense of place. Um, it's about a probationary constable called Peter Grant. He wants to be a detective, but he's been assigned to basically a paper pushing job. However, everything changes when he's interviewing a witness to a crime who he later discovers is actually a ghost. And then everything gets really weird. It's snarky and fast paced and a lot of fun. Another older title is American Gods by Neil Gaiman. There's a TV series of this, so you, you may have seen that or heard of that. Um, the book is about Shadow, who has just gotten out of prison. He meets Mr. Wednesday on an airplane who knows way too much about him, 
and ends up offering the job, which Shadow takes. And the book is really about Okay, I'm Monica McAbee, and I'm going to talk about books that mostly came out in the last decade, and in my opinion, didn't get quite as much buzz as I think they deserved. And then I'm going to finish by talking about a book that I haven't read yet, but it just won the Nebula Award. So I'm going to start with a book called Semiosis by Sue Burke. It came out in 2018. In this book, it's hard science fiction genre. A group of idealists leave Earth to found a colony on another planet, but their ship lands in an unexpected star system. The colonists struggle to survive on limited resources on a planet with dangerously unpredictable vegetation. Seemingly the same trees offer delicious fruit one day and poison the next. Strangest of all, one plant system appears to be trying to communicate with the humans. Will this plant prove to be an ally or a foe. I like first contact stories uh, where humans are discovering an alien race. I also like stories where people are colonizing another planet. In this multi-generational story that goes decade by decade, they show how this small civilization struggles to make their colony work um, amidst so many dangers. The um, Characters are all very unique, sympathetic, uh, realistic, except maybe for the alien. You decide on that. The um, tone is dramatic, but also thought provoking. And the writing style is richly detailed, which I, I always love. I, I like anything that gives you a strong sense of place. So that's Semiosis by Sue Burke. And it's the first in a duology. The sequel is called Interference. Now for some literary social science fiction. Um, An Unkindness of Ghosts by Rivers Solomon. In this story, a black woman living on a generation starship defies the racist privileged class who have turned the ship's society into a copy of our slave holding Southern past. I like generation ship stories where multi generations are, are traveling through space. But the twist here is that there's a focus on race relations and a strong female character fighting for her right to live her life and also fighting for the rest of her people. So it's an awesome story. And the um, writing style is stylistically complex. The world building is really interesting. And uh, the end of the story takes you somewhere maybe not expected. So that's An Unkindness of Ghosts by Rivers Solomon, came out in 2017. Blackfish City by Sam Miller is dystopian fiction, um, although maybe not too dystopian. Uh, it came out in 2018. In this one, refugees from a world ruined by climate change try to survive in a floating city built in the Arctic Circle. Because this is a city of humans, there's corruption, there's crime, disease, prejudice. Then a woman arrives riding an orca and accompanied by a polar bear. And a day of reckoning is coming. Uh, well, first of all, who can resist the idea of an Arctic floating city? That drew me right away. You also have some pretty badass human animal uh, personality integration. Uh, humans can bond with an animal. And so I don't remember whether the woman was bonded with the orca or the polar bear. Read it and find out. Um, in this story, marginalized people tend to be some of the main characters. And uh, the pace intensifies as you go along. And the story is intricately plotted. There's a lot going on and it's just fascinating. So that's Blackfish City by Sam Miller. Hollow Kingdom is something a little bit different. This is by Kira Jane Buxton. It came out in 2019, yes. Um, in this one, uh, sensing something is wrong with his owner, a domesticated crow abandons the only life he ever knew to discover that humans are turning into zombies. Uh-oh. 
he must use knowledge gleaned from his TV viewing to save them. Okay, I took that from an annotation. It's not quite accurate. He's not trying to save the humans. They're a lost cause. Some of us would agree. Um, but what he ends up doing is trying to save all of the domesticated animals in his city, which happens to be Seattle. Um, all those pets that are now locked in their houses with owners who can no longer take care of them because they're zombies. So uh, our crow, whose initials are ST, and I'm not gonna say on, on air what that stands for, uh, narrates his story and explains how he gets all of his uh, animal friends to stage a rescue. This is pretty neat. Um, it's very snarky, as you can imagine. Um, great, engaging writing style. Very funny. So uh, this was one that I recommended to a friend of mine who loves crows, real ones. And he, he, he liked that a lot. So that was uh, Hollow Kingdom by Kira Jane Buxton. Blind Sight by Peter Watts. Now this is slightly older. This came out in 2006, but it's really amazing. It's worth some more buzz. In this uh, hard science fiction first contact story, an odd assortment of diplomats, including a linguist with a multi multiple personality disorder, a biologist spliced into machinery, a pacifist warrior, and a vampire, journey to the far edges of the solar system to seek out a mysterious alien presence that may or may not want to meet with them, and that may or may not be friendly towards Earth. I liked the mind-blowing ideas that are in this story and the very unusual characters, as you just heard in the description. Um, it, it, it's hard to describe the plot or anything, so just know that this is a very well-told, suspenseful, uh, almost creepy tale of going out into space and trying to figure out what that thing is out there. And it's called Blind Sight by Peter Watts. Now, one uh, that's a fantasy in a steampunk mode is the Books of Babel series by Josiah Bancroft. Bancroft spoke at last year's uh, MLA DLA conference. He's local-ish. He lives in Pennsylvania. He self-published the first one or two books of this back in 2013, and then they were picked up by a traditional publisher. So the first book is the one I'm going to describe briefly. It's called Senlin Ascends. And in this one, mild-mannered Thomas Senlin's wife disappears on their honeymoon. They've traveled to the Tower of Babel, which is a, a tourist destination, and it's supposed to be this really wonderful place. But the first day, as soon as they get there, Senlin's wife disappears in the crowds and he's got to try to find her and save her. When he enters the tower to try to meet up with her, he discovers that it's not everything that the guidebooks promised it would be. It's something much darker, uh, much more corrupt, much more dangerous. So this mild-mannered school teacher, a man of letters, must now become a man of action, as the publisher's plot synopsis says. Um, this is a very Baroque steampunk story. There's a lot going on. I love the twisty turny plot. I've read three of the books so far. The fourth one is due out next year and it's called The Fall of Babel. The title was just uh, announced last April. So this one, you'll like it if you enjoy very descriptive writing not necessarily a fast pace, but a very compelling story. It'll suck you in, just as poor Senlin is sucked into the tower. So that's the uh, Books of Babel series by Josiah Bancroft, starting with Senlin Ascends. And another fantasy one, uh, one that some people are calling Silk Punk, because it's inspired by um, the history, the politics and culture of China's Han Dynasty. It's called The Grace of Kings by Ken Liu. And it's an epic fantasy um, where empire and rebellion uh, are the setting. 
there are two main characters who start out as friends and become adversaries. And it's got a lot of court intrigue. Uh, I'm going to quote Amal El Mokhtar, one of our other reviewers just mentioned, quote, a book interested in the depth and breadth of empires and nation states, from the mythic scope of battles to the minutia of taxes. But its innovation lends grandeur to taxes and turns mighty battles into administrivia. Its main characters are very sympathetic. You want to find out what's gonna to happen to them. You wanna see how they handle their adversities. It's an own voices story in that Ken Liu is Chinese American. So he's using um, some of the history of his heritage. And it's got a sequel called The Wall of Storms. And uh, it, he's also announced the third and last book in the trilogy called The Veiled Throne, also to come out next year. Finally, uh, one book that I'm very much looking forward to reading, it's by a Maryland author. Her name is Sarah Pinsker. Uh, it's called A Song for a New Day, just won the Nebula Award. This is a um, social science fiction. The plot is because of terrorist attacks and a global pandemic, public gatherings have been made illegal and social distancing is now a permanent way of life. Keep in mind, Pinsker wrote this a while ago. The story focuses on a mus musician who lives through this change and a young person who never knew any other way of life, and what happens when their worlds intersect. So I am very much looking forward to reading A Song for a New Day by Sarah Pinsker. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our sci-fi and fantasy readers advisory. Um, check out our pdcmls.info website for more events and virtual programs. Um, and happy reading. Bye, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>